And a lot of people have uh, mentioned it. And I've just about hit every sin I can think of. And everything. And tonight I'm going to brag on the Word of God a little bit. Thank God that we've got a Bible. Thank God for the Word. Boy, we don't know how to preach it, do we? Psalm 12, verse 6. Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. There you, there's the doctrine of inspiration. The words of the Lord. Pure word. The doctrine of inspiration. Here's the doctrine of preservation. Next verse. Thou shalt keep them. What? The words. O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. Amen. The doctrine of preservation is taught in the Bible the same as the doctrine of inspiration. There are out there in the Baptist circles today about the doctrine of inspiration. That's how far off we've got. And a lot of the independent Baptist churches are arguing over the doctrine of preservation, whether or not we still have the words of God that we can get a hold of today. Whether or not you want to admit it or not, that's the big question. The big question is authority. The big question is what authority do we have to base what we believe on? I'd like to preach to you tonight on the Bible, the Word of God. I have two reasons for preaching this message tonight. I bring the introduction by giving you these two reasons. Number one would be the ignorance of the Bible among the average American is astounding, and especially those who profess to be Christian. It is said that the average American cannot quote two verses of Scripture from memory. We'd be shocked here tonight if we knew the ignorance of the Bible uh, right here in our own town. Somebody asked a little girl one time if she knew anything that was in the Bible. She said, oh yes, there's a pressed squirrel tail, a rose from Aunt Molly's grave, a lock of Grandma's hair, an insurance receipt, and Pa's Masonic Lodge emblem. And that was all the little girl knew. Some people think the Bible is a hope, like a chest, where you keep old records and, you know, four-leaf clovers. You ever seen them stick a four-leaf clover in a Bible and that's supposed to make some good things happen to you and that kind of thing? That's all she knew that was in the Bible. A student at Yale was asked, to say something about Golgotha. Their answer, quote, Golgotha was a giant who slew Apostle David. A questionary of 18,434 high school students. 18,434 high school students were surveyed. 16,000 of them could not name three Old Testament prophets. 12,000 could not name the four Gospels. 10,000 could not name three of the Lord's disciples. They said Esau wrote fables and sold his copyright for a mess of potash. They said Brutus was the man who betrayed Jesus. They said Moses built the ark. They did a survey of another crowd of about 90-something high school students. Forty-four didn't know who Jesus was, or Joseph was. Fifty-one of them didn't know who Luke was. Forty-six of them did not know Herod or Pilate. Sixty did not know the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. Eighty did not know the mother of John the Baptist. And ten of them did not know where Christ was born. Ninety out of ninety-four did not know the Ten Commandments. They thought Sodom and Gomorrah were a husband and wife team and on and on and on. Now we think we shake our head and we say, oh, how horrible. But if I ask you to stand up tonight and name me the Ten Commandments, could you do it? If I ask you tonight to name me the Twelve Disciples, could you do that? The ignorance of the Bible is amazing with all the preaching and all the studying and the, and the tapes and the material that we have available at our fingertips. The second reason I have for bringing this message tonight is that the devil is attacking the Bible as never before concerning inspiration, preservation, dependability, 
reliability, and authority. Never before has the Bible been so made fun of. It is constantly slandered, laughed at, scorned, ridiculed, and made fun of on the TV and air, uh, radio airwaves. Somebody said when that Doc Tari series was aired 20 years ago that if you gave enough chimpanzees, enough typewriters, that sooner or later one of them would come up with a King James version of the Bible. They have laughed and made fun of the Word of God. They were arguing this homosexual rights thing the other day. Somebody told me they said that they were laughing at the Bible. They said it's ridiculous to trust a book written 2,000 years ago. It's crazy. It's outrageous to, in these modern times to still believe a book like that. But our Bible says tonight the words of the Lord are purified seven times. I'd like to give you those seven points in my mind tonight. The way I, I look at them, the Lord gave me this outline many years ago, and I want to give it to you. The words of the Lord are purified seven times. First of all tonight, I'd like to say the Bible is pure in its production. And originally, the Bible, of course, written by 40 different men over a period of 1,600 years. The Bible said in 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1.21, all Scripture, St. Timothy 3.16, is given by inspiration of God. That means that the Holy Ghost got a hold of the head and the heart and the hand of those men and pinned down for them what God wanted us to have in the Bible, the Word of God. It's pure in its production. Forty men over a period of 1,600 years and not one contradiction in the entire Bible. You say, I know a man that knows, said there's a contradiction in the Bible. No, the contradiction's in his head. It's not in the Word of God. He just don't read the Bible and know the Bible. Most people who say the Bible has contradictions in it never read it anyway. They said that because some famous infidel said it and they want to sound smart like they think that person they're quoting is. Many other books were supposedly inspired but never were accepted in the divine, what we call the canon. Now, the divine canon, there's 66 books in what's an inspired canon. Like, you get that word from straight, gun barrel straight, doctrine of Scripture. Only 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. There are some places and some people in the world that has what they call the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha is included in a Catholic Bible, and they have seven books in it that you will not find in your King James Bible. They say that that's the so-called lost books of the Bible and things of that nature. There's books in there called the Acts of Andrew, the Apocalypse of Paul, the Gospel of Thomas, the Acts of Thaddeus, Epistle of Polycarp, and to the Philippians, and, and so forth and so on. And they all try to claim, the, you know, people try to claim those are part of the inspired canon. But what people don't realize is there's two things about that Apocrypha. Three things. Number one, the early church never accepted them as being inspired of God. Number two, none of those apocryphal books ever claim that they are inspired of God. And number three, no New Testament character, including the Lord Jesus Christ, ever quoted from any of those apocryphal books. You've got the right books in your Bible. There are no lost books of the Bible. There ain't no such a thing, to put it in country language, that God never lost a word. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. I'm telling you tonight, if you've got a King James Bible, you've got the Word of God. If you didn't know that by studying church history, you'd know it by reading the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah has 66 
chapters. 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah matching the 66 books in the Bible. There is a division after chapter 39 of Isaiah marking the division between Old Testament and New Testament. Isaiah had no way of knowing how many books there was going to be in the Bible. Isaiah put a definite division between 39 and 40. The 40th book in the Bible is Matthew. John the Baptist shows up preaching and John the Baptist shows up in, in Isaiah chapter 40. It's a perfect picture of the Word of God. 66 chapters ends with a new heaven and the new earth just like your last book in the Bible Revelation ends with a new heaven and the new earth. Isaiah didn't know Matthew. Isaiah didn't know John the Revelator. They weren't even divided up into books in Isaiah's day. That was the hand of God preserved his word through the centuries so much that a lot of scholars believe that two different men wrote the book of Isaiah. It's absolutely amazing. Now, everybody get settled down now. Nobody else get up, okay? Nobody, unless you're a ba mother with a baby or a baby with a mother. Huh? You get that, okay? Listen, it is pure in its production. You know, when that early church came upon some writing and somebody come in and they said, hey, this is inspired literature. They didn't just say, well, hey, he's a smart man. We're going to take his word for it asked several questions. They asked, number one, was the writer an apostle? They said if the writer wasn't an apostle, we don't want to fool with it. They asked, number two, did the Holy Ghost bear witness to what that writing and document had to say? Number three, they asked, did it contradict other writings of the Scripture? Number four, they asked, did the body of Christ in general accept them? And finally had concluded that God had inspired 27 books of the New Testament already shown by Isaiah and in use in the Old Latin around 180 A.D. before any of those guys were born. Thank God when God had this man write a bit, this man write a little bit, this man wrote a little bit, this man wrote a little bit, preserved it down through those hundreds of years. You think about how old these writings are of Genesis and Exodus. 4,000 years old! And we still got it right here in 1992, studying it, preaching it, loving it, singing it, telling about it. Thank God the Bible's pure in its production. But number two, let me say, uh, before I move on to number two, I'll say how precious is the Word of God. How precious is the book divine by inspiration given. Bright as a lamp its doctrine shine to guide our souls to heaven. This lamp through all the tedious night of life shine our way till we behold the clear light of an eternal day. I want to say secondly tonight, it's pure in its preservation. The words of the Lord are preserved. Here's where the rubber meets the road. If you went to any seminary, Baptist seminary in America, just about every one of them would tell you the Bible was inspired by God. If you go to a church and you say, hey, let me see your constitution. You see a missionary's card, let me see what you believe. They'll say, we believe the Bible was originally inspired of God. You know what they're saying? They are saying that one time, one place, sometime, somewhere, God inspired the original manuscripts, then they got lost, and all we have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, and there is no such thing as an inspired Bible on this earth. That's what they believe. If you don't believe it, if you, don't, you, don't, you, you name me any close Baptist seminary to right here, and I can prove you that they believe. They believe the original manuscripts were inspired. You say, well, I know one, buddy, he don't preach nothing but the King James. Like, don't let them fool you with that, brother. When a man said, we don't use nothing but the King James here, that the key word to understanding that crook is the word use. We're not interested in what you use. We want to know what do you believe. If you see a guy that said, we believe the King James Bible is the Word of God without any mistakes, there's the right crowd to get hooked up with. You see a guy say, we only use, I'll never preach out of anything but a King James. So what? 
Big deal. Here's a man. I know there's teachers in them schools that will not even use another Bible, but the other Bibles are more correct than the King James. That's a hypocrite. If I believe, if I believe there was another Bible more accurate than this Bible, I would put this one down. I would get it up here and I'd preach it to you every Sunday to go buy you one. I'd say that's the closest. One. Let's get with it. I'm not gonna stand up here and say, "Oh, the old King James says this," but a better reading would be just so I can get people's money and keep a job. Amen? Amen, brother. It's pure and it's pure. The Word of God is preserved. Do we still have God's Word today? Or do we have translations with errors in it? I know a young man that used to go street preaching with us. And that boy, he loved the Lord. I mean, he'd stand down there at the trade lot and wave that King Bible in the air and he'd say, prepare to meet God. This is the Word of God. Get right with God. And he started going to seminary. I'm not against an education. You ought to get all you can get. Nothing wrong going to Bible school. If the Lord leads you, don't take me wrong. But I'm doing this. Well, the Word of God is the Word of God. God. And that old boy, he, he went to school for about six months. I met him up in the old building. And I said, uh, how's it going, brother? He said, uh, well, pretty good. I, I said, you still preaching? You know, he said, I don't hardly believe that way no more. I said, really? He said, my professor at school told me when I got ready to preach a sermon that I should lay out at least five versions of the Bible. And I should pick which one I think is closest to my text. And I said, well, brother, that's you in a pretty big position, don't it? You are going to decide what God really meant and what God really said there? I always thought the Bible told us what was right and wrong. No, we told it what was right and what was wrong. And the problem we got in these schools today, brother, is instead of people being in subjection to the book, we have a bunch of people that have the book under subjection to them. And that's backward. If you don't believe it, call up the first 50 preachers you find in an average town and ask them, is there one book on this earth that is infallible, inspired, in Aaron, word of God, and you will be shocked at the answer you hear. I talked to a Mormon one time. I said, you believe the Bible? And they said, of course, we believe the Bible in as much as it is translated correctly. I said, Lordy mercy, that's what the Baptists believe. The Baptists believe the Bible in so far as it is translated correctly. They just believe different parts of it was translated correctly than the Mormons do. What's the difference? They just picked out different parts they thought was wrong. I'm telling you tonight, my dear friend, the truth is we do not have the originals. The truth is nobody has the original manuscripts. And if we do not have the Word of God right here, then we do not have the Word of God at all. That's what it boils down to. You say, well, I believe it's almost right. Then who decides what part's not right? You say educated scholars, where do they get their authority? You say from the Bible, which Bible? You say from the Greek, there's 2,700 different Greek manuscripts. Amen? It's pure in its preservation. Well, let me give you a little bit, little problem here, a little, little background, a little history here. I preach a message like this, and there'll be somebody here on the radio. Somebody's going to hear this on the radio, and they'll say this. They'll say, well, that preacher's crazy. He's just a hick from North Carolina, don't know nothing. What about all them people before 1611? They didn't have, now they're just showing you ignorance. God's always had a book. God's always blessed a book. God only wrote one book and he's blessed it through the different languages down through the years. For you that have that argument, I give you some church hissy. God promised in Psalm 12 to preserve his word and he has. Psalm 119 verse 89, he said, settle in heaven forever. They've been arguing about it for a hundred years, but they were copied, the original manuscripts were copied in a biblion. That means a little book in in Koine Greek, from, uh, from Greece. That's the language of the common people. Not classical Greek. There are a lot of this stuff saying. Koine Greek. They, they're in the Syrian text of Asia Minor from Antioch. Acts chapter 11. In Antioch is where the 
disciples were first called Christians. That's where God blessed. That's where the gospel was being preached. That's where the real name Christian got tagged all up. First time you find it in the Bible, Acts chapter 11. They were found, those same manuscripts were in Palestine in 80 A.D., in Antioch in 100 A.D., in Syria in 150 A.D., in the Italic Church in 180 A.D., the Gallic Church in South France in 200 A.D., the Celtic Church in England in 300 A.D., the Balkans and Germans, Germany in 400 A.D. It is the received text, received by the common people, of the Albigenses, the Bulgarians, the Paulicians, the Bogomiles, the Baptists, and the old-time Huguenots. Therefore, the text the text of the King James Bible that we now possess appeared in German in the early German translations from Erasmus, the French translations from uh, Levitan and Leclerc, the Italian translation from Diadocian, and the old Latin of the Waldenses and Albigenses in Gothic, in the Gothic uh, Old Testaments, in the Greek Unical Manuscripts, and the vast majority of all the Greek manuscripts, about 85%, the papyrus in the 2nd and 3rd century bears witness, the old Syriac, 100 AD, bears witness. It is the God-honored Greek text preserved through the years through Erasmus, Elzevir, and Stephanus. It is the God-honored English text preserved through Tyndale, 1525, Geneva, 1562, and in the King James, 1611, authorized version. God only wrote one book, and He's preserved it down through the years. It's pure in its preservation. It's plain and need no help. This book, Ingersoll, many, many years ago, held up a copy of the Bible. He was an atheist. He held up a copy of the Bible. And he said, quote, In 15 years, I'll have this book in the morgue. Fifteen years went by, Ingersoll was in the morgue. And the Bible was still doing fine. Another fellow jumped up by the name of Hume. Oh, Hume said, quote, Me thinks I see the twilight of Christianity. And the Auxiliary Bible Society of Edinburgh had its first meeting in the room in which Hume died. God's got a way of playing tricks on old reprobates like that. Voltaire said, in 100 years, the Bible would be an outdated and forgotten book only to be found in museums. When the 100 years went by, Voltaire's house was owned and used by Geneva Bible Society to print copies of the Word of God and get the book out. I'm telling you, God's hand is on that book. And there's never been another book like this book out here. Boy, just get it up some of and get up, just hug it and hold it. Boy, you've got the greatest treasure in the world. If you've got a Bible, these are the inspired words of God Almighty. It's pure in its preservation. Number three, the third way it purifies it, it's pure in its presentation. You know, this book makes some wild presentation. It presents some strange thing. Here's a book laying on our lap that says, No peace on earth till Jesus Christ comes and sets up his kingdom. What do you think about that? What do you think that mighty nation? You see why? You see how the Bible don't fit in at a at a United Peace Corps meeting? I mean, here's them guys saying, Yes, we can do it. Yes, we can do it. What does that book say? It says you'll never have peace on earth till the Prince of Peace comes and sits on his throne. That's it. Period. There ain't no other book claims like that. My, my, my. And history bears it out, don't it? You know, the Germans have a saying, and the Germans have a saying that says, they say, in case of, war, in case of rain, the war will be held in the auditorium. And what that means is people are quiet. 
you're not going to have peace on this earth. There ain't been 10 minutes peace on this earth since Cain knocked Abel's brains out. They've been fighting ever since, since sin come into this world. And brother, it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse until the Lord sets up His throne. Well, what about this? The book said that God created the heaven and the earth. What do you think about that? That don't go over too well in a college, does it? I mean, here's a guy. I heard about this little girl the other day on the radio. I was over in Apple coming through Asheville. I had a precept funeral over there the, the other day. Oh, that Miss Parker that used to come here to church some. And I heard on the radio. And I heard that on the radio over there, boy. And they talking about this little girl. She's only in the third grade at school. And this little girl, I think it was Charity, somebody. That bless her heart, that little girl, they had to write a report about a famous person. And she wrote her report about Jesus Christ. And the teacher rejected it and said, That's not acceptable. You can't do your report, Jesus Christ. And the family said, Why not? He's a famous person. They said, well, that's, that's religion. You're mixing religion in the school. Boy, I tell you what, somebody ought to stand up against this school mess. And, and I mean, I thank God for these law organizations. That is hogwash, brother. Jesus Christ was a historical figure, and he is a famous person. That's a wicked teacher under conviction, what that is. That name Jesus bothered that old gal. We got two old gals teach right across the road over here. They didn't really bother from what I hear. So what a sermon on queers. Amen. I want to tell you something. This scene and brother, they hate that book. You know what I read in the Bible this week? I read in the book of Leviticus where it says, If a man lies with another man, it is abomination. Brother, that don't fit too good in this day and time. That don't fit too good in this day and time. And if you're not careful, you'll get your mind full of Phil Donahue and Araldo and Oprah and all that, and you'll think, well, maybe, well, maybe, no, not well, maybe. There ain't no maybes about it. God done said it. That's it. It's settled forever in heaven, and you can't change it. This book makes some strong presentations. This book right here says it's wrong to shack up. Amen? This book says adultery is wrong. Boy, that don't go over too good in our society. They're even telling you now on television that an affair is healthy for your marriage. It, uh, it's, it's unhealthy for your body is what it is. You get AIDS and die if you ain't careful. And I'm going to tell you what, my dear friend, this book says it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Case closed. Shut the door. I close the curtains. It's over. God said it. That says it. That's all there are to it. It's pure in its presentation. I tell you, this book says ain't but two places where people go when they die, heaven or hell. Somebody told me on somebody called me the other day, and this guy he's talking to me. He said, now he, he said he had a friend that committed suicide. He started asking me where he's at. And I said, Well, if, if, was he saved or, or what? I said, it, it, it depends. It don't depend on how you die, it depends on whether you're saved or not. And he, he began talking. He said, Well, if he wasn't saved, he'd go to purgatory, wouldn't he? And stay there a while. And then go on to heaven. And I said, No, he wasn't. There ain't no such place as purgatory. The book says there ain't but two places where people go. Heaven and hell. There is no such thing as purgatory in the Bible. You see why the Bible ain't too popular in our generation? It goes completely against everything they believe and want to try to do. Messing everybody up. Boy, listen, all this stuff they're wrong now about the new uh, Rodney King trials and all this stuff coming up, brother. Listen, if people just go by what the book says and say this is right, it don't matter where you are. Right's right and wrong's wrong. It don't matter if you're white, black, purple, green, polka dot. I, I believe, brother, if a man applies for the job and he's purple and he can do the best job, give him the job. Amen? I don't believe I ought to have to hire you because you're purple. I don't mean I ought to have to rent my apartment to you because you're green. If I my apartment, I can rent it to all I want to. That's where it's supposed to be. That's what the Bible recognizes. Personal property, personal right, personal freedom. Brother, we've got this thing all messed up in America. We have got to get to the place. People, I heard somebody, some idiot say not too long ago that God is colorblind. Have you ever heard anything that stupid in your life? God ain't colorblind. You think God's handicapped? Are you not God colorblind? You think?
think God can't tell what color that thing is right there? You think you're smarter than the Lord is? Well, he don't, do, he don't see. He does see. He sees everything and knows everything and then judges right. That's hard for us to do. We're so full of prejudices. But I tell you what, God's not. God's right. He's just. He's equal. He's holy. He's pure in his presentation. Well, I got to get up. I heard about this old lady one time. She's talking about the stories in the Bible. And this atheist come up and he's laughing at her. And he said, you don't believe all that stuff, do you? She said, yes, sir, I sure do. He said, you believe that junk about that man Jonah swallowed by that whale? And he, oh, come on. She said, yes, sir, I sure do. And he said, you can believe that. Lived in the belly of a whale, stayed in there three days and spit him out. You don't believe that, do you? She said, yes, sir. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah about it. And he said, well, what if he ain't in heaven? She said, well, you can ask him then. And what she's saying is, brother, if you ain't going to heaven, go going to hell. There ain't but two places you can go. Let me say number four right quickly. Let me move along. The Bible is pure in its provisions. The Bible is pure in its provisions. It's provided us with many, many blessings. From it has come the foundation home, our society, our government, our schools, and thank God, our churches. You know what? These atheists here in America, they ought to go somewhere and live where the Bible hasn't been preached. Now they say that Africa's the oldest civilization, right? If Africa's the oldest civilization, Africa should be much further advanced than we are, right? But it ain't. You don't ever hear that on TV. It ain't. And America ain't 200 years old. Oh, it's because we're so smart. No, it ain't. It's because we believed that book when we started out. And God, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. God blessed America because America You don't believe in equal rights for women. The Bible's against women. Let me tell you something, sister. You're treated better in a Christian church, in a Christian family. You go somewhere where they don't have the Bible and see how women are treated. Oh, Lord, have mercy. The beast of burden, as Brother John mentioned in Sunday school this morning, they're swapped off like property. And, Brother, treated with no rights whatsoever. This Bible's the greatest blessing you ladies ever had. This Bible's the greatest blessing you men ever had. I tell you, it's pure in its provision. It's a fire. If you want something that will warm your soul, this old book right here on it. If you're cold on God, spend a couple of hours reading the old book. It'll start burning in your soul again. It's a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. It's a sword that'll cut coming and going. It's a mirror that reflects. You know why a lot of people don't like the Bible? Because the Bible's a mirror. Have you ever, have you ever been living wicked and just opened the Bible and ooh, and it got you just like that? Boy, the Lord's got a way of doing that. Now, don't don't let that be your way of Bible study. For heaven's sake, get beyond that. Don't, don't be one of these Christians that every day gets up and say, all right, Lord, what do you want me to see today? Poom! You know, I'm putting my finger down. Oh, God really speaks to me like that, preacher. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. One guy said, oh, God, speak to me. He flipped up in his Bible, put his finger down, opened his eyes, and said, Judas went out and hanged himself. <laughs> all right, Lord, what do you want me to do? Flipped it over there. He said, show me something, Lord. Finger down and said, go and do thou likewise. Oh, God, that couldn't have been you. Lord, show me one more time, God. He flipped it on over, put his finger down and said, that thou doest do quickly. <laughs> oh, my soul. Wouldn't that be awful? That ain't the way to study the Bible. That ain't the way to get in the Word of God. My soul, brother, this is a book. You don't read, any other, you don't read the newspaper like that. Boom. I mean, you start out and get in, a, in a, a section of it and get in that thing and read it. It's pure in its provision. You know why a lot of people don't like the Bible? Because it knows all about you and tells it. Have you ever been around people dressed up real nice, you know, been around a crowd of maybe young? I was talking about us getting old a while ago. I was talking about old Patrick Swayze. Who's that other one I was saying? That big parish, the chief, the chief, and uh, the other guy, Christy Brinkley, whatever she is. <laughs> uh, 
I was talking about us all getting older and everything. You know what? As you get older, you don't like? You don't like a mirror. You imagine yourself in pretty good shape. But boy, when you get in front of that mirror, you know why that mirror, you don't like that mirror? That mirror don't lie. It, it don't say, why, you look so wonderful. Chris, she's been telling me, she said, Daddy, you got wrinkles. And I said, well, honey, the reason I got them little wrinkles right there is because I've smiled so much. And every time I smile, it, it creases the skin right there, and I've smiled it so much, it, it's made wrinkles in there. And I said, you're going to have them just like Daddy's look. And she'd smile, and she'd have a little rose feet right there. And, and she, she just kept messing with it and messing with it. She said, you got one right there, too. You got, I started to say, shut up! And so, <laughs> they're coming, they're coming. And boy, you get in front of that mirror, son, that old mirror tell it like it is, won't it? It don't smooth it over for you. That's just it. That's it. You ain't even made like you used to be made. Well, you guys used to have it up here, you know, like this. Now, you know, something's happened to you. <laughs> I, that, I think I believe it was Bobby Thompson said that time. He said, I've got furniture disease. <laughs> you know, a chest done fell in the drawers. <laughs> I t- <laughs> That's all. That's what happens to men. It moves. And you women too, brother. Things change. Things change. Things change. She, she ain't what she used to be. You ain't what you used to be. Now I'm telling you, that mirror. I just, I put up a, a mirror for my wife and uh, she, we didn't have a full length mirror in the bathroom. I put one up the other day. Yesterday, I reckon, maybe. Yes, yeah, Friday one. Where you full length. You can stand in front of that thing that shows you all the way from head to toe. Oh, that's why people don't like a Bible, brother. It tells you just exactly what you are and don't cut you no slack. Somebody, you might go to somebody, they may pat you on the back. Oh, you're all right. The Bible don't do that. If you ain't, it don't tell you you're all right if you ain't all right. If you ain't all right, it'll tell you you're not all right. If you're doing something wrong, it'll say thou shalt not. If you're doing something, you're not doing something, yes, do that. The Bible is pure in its provision. A famous warrior said, Napoleon Bonaparte said, the Bible is no mere book, but a living power that conquers all that oppose it. A famous philosopher, Sir Francis Bacon, said, There never was found in any age of the world either religion or law that did so highly exalt the public good as the Bible. William Henry Seward said, The whole hope of human progress is suspended on the ever-growing influence of the Bible, the Word of God. George Washington, as we have these famous people on the witness stand, talked about it's impossible to rightly govern the world. God and the world, him, Lincoln, them guys, they said you can't do it without the Bible. The Bible's got to be put first place in people's life. It is great in its provision. Let me say, uh, it's, it, it'll, it'll tell you what's right and wrong. Let me illustrate. I've given this illustration before, but listen, it's very much... Um, Quickly, help me out here now. Help me out. I want to find out how wide this pulpit is. From right here to right here in inches. I want to find out exactly how many inches in it. Any brother? 37 and three quarters. 37 and three quarters. All right. How many, brother? You're a carpenter. You ought to know that. 40 inches. 40 inches. I've got 37 and three quarters. I've got 40. All right. Brother Burleson. Four inches. He agrees with him. Does that mean they're right? No. Uh, we just got to opinions. That's all we got is opinion. How many do you think, Cadge? Forty inches. That's three for forty. How many do you think, Brother Bruce? Forty-two. Forty-two, forty, thirty-seven and three quarters. All right. Uh, how about you, John? Forty-two. How about you, brother? Three of my shoes. Three of his shoes. All right. Now, we have all these different opinions here. You know what? You know what? You know what we got in most churches tonight? We, well, I think then. And I think that. And I think that we ought to do this. And I think that it's bad. I think this is wrong. I think that is wrong. I think that. And you ain't never going to have nothing but arguments until somebody does one thing. What do we need here? We need a ruler. Now, a ruler will settle this thing. Okay? This right here, he is the ruler. 
It don't matter if you agree with it or not. The ruler's right. You're wrong. You say, well, I believe with all my heart. It's 36 inches. Well, it don't matter what you believe. The ruler's right. It don't matter what I believe. We go by what the ruler says. Oh, I don't like the ruler. You can't change the whole measuring system of the country, brother. You got to line up with it. This is what you call a standard. This is what you call a final authority. I, ladies and gentlemen, right before your very eyes, am going to measure this pulpit and tell you how, how long it is, how wide it is, and we will find out. The ones that's wrong are going to get mad and quit church. Go start their own denomination. Call it the 42-inch pulpit Baptist. That'll be the 36-inch pulpit Baptist. That's what people do nowadays. They, well, I think this, I think that. Who cares what you think? Let's get the ruler out and see what's on going on here, okay? Boy, I like carrying this thing around here. Gives me a little, uh, <laughs> all right, here we go. Forty inches on the button. Hey, everybody that said 40 inches, raise your hand. Hey, let's give my a big hand. Woo, hallelujah. Hey, hey, hey it wasn't right because they said it. It was right because this said it. Now, here's a man. Did you know if they'd take, Phil Donahue wouldn't have a job if they'd just took the ruler on his show? Here's one that's saying, well, I feel like I was born this way. And, and somebody stands up and says, well, I don't think, uh, I don't think, shut up, everybody shut up. Let's pull out the ruler. Put it on here. What does it say? Case closed. Go home. Get somebody else on here. Quit wasting your time. See what I'm saying? This thing right here is the ruler. It decides what's right and what's wrong. I, if there's anything that burns me up, is see them get on television and interview the president. Well, I feel like, and I feel like abortion or that. I feel like, and nobody says what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? It's pure in its protection. Number five. You know this old book's protected us. If it wasn't for the Bible, we'd probably. Be where would you be right now if it was not for the Word of God in your life, influence of the Word of God? I'll move on quickly tonight because i got seven of these, got two more after this one. But i tell you what the best protection you ladies can have in public is your Bible under one arm, a can of mace in the other. <laughs> take, that, take that book with you, brother. All this talk nowadays about sexual harassment. You can't even speak to somebody now that you're sexually harassing them. And now everybody's wanting to make a case about it, you know, and all that. You say, well, I just wish those men at work would leave me alone. I'll tell you, all you got to do if you mean that. Now, some of you don't mean it. There ain't no hope for you if you mean it. I had a woman told me one time, she said, well, these men, they just, they just bother me and they just call me and they just, and they just won't leave me alone. And son... I could see why. The way she dressed and the way she wore her, you know, carried herself and all that. I mean, what, what's a man supposed to think? Don't get mad at the man for thinking that if you're giving him that impression. But now, if you ain't doing nothing to give him that impression and you're innocent and you ain't trying to look like some, you know, some sleaze or Cindy Crawford or somebody and you ain't trying to mess nobody up, and they still bother you, here's all you got to do. Take this with you. Big and like this right here. <laughs> Lay it down there. Every time you get a break, read it like that. They will not bother you. I promise. Amen. They will not bother you. Amen. Boy, Lord have mercy. You, my soul, you girl, when, I, when, old, when old boy takes you girl from school, or he gets out beside you on the swing, He's courting you. You say, well, how am I going to make him mind his own manners, preacher? Put this right there. He said over there, you said over here. He ain't got enough nerve to climb over that thing. It'll jump up there and bite him. Look at here. Would you explain this verse to me? Boy, that'll do it. You want me to leave you alone? Take this book right here. 
Take the name of Jesus with you. That book, that book will protect you. You've heard me tell him stories about the guy that got shot in the army. You know, he had the New Testament in his pocket and the bullet stopped right there at Psalm 91. One. Kept him from getting killed. Excuse me, Psalm 91, I'm sorry. And in Psalm 91, you know what it said? It said, A thousand fall at your right hand, ten thousand at your left hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. You heard me tell that story about where a guy was going to get robbed. They found a testament. They, they, they said, oh man, this guy must be a preacher or something, and run and left him. You've heard the story of the old headhunter who was converted. And boy, he's out in the jungle. And he got saved. And this old wicked, atheistic American went through the jungle. And there was that old converted headhunter. And he had his Bible laying there. And he had his stuff stirring here. And this smoke coming up out of this pot. And this old smart little American went over and he said, oh, good night. They've done come over here and messed up you you people like that. He said, let me ask you something. You believe that Bible? Headhunter said, yes. He said, you tell me one good thing that Bible's ever done for anybody. What good's that Bible ever done for anybody? The headhunter looked at him and said, if it were not for that Bible, your head would be in that pot. <laughs> that done him some good, didn't it? I'm glad the Bible protects us. Amen? Let me say sixly tonight, I'm going to hurry. It is pure in its promises exceeding great and precious promises. Oh, how many times I've got First John 1, 9 down. How many times I've walked up to Calvary's mountain with my load of despair and laid it down at the feet of the Lamb. I'm glad First John 1, 9 said, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I'm glad the book promised we can have power over sin. What if it wasn't for those precious promises what if we didn't have the promise that God would forgive us? We think, oh no, he's tired of fooling with me. But we've got the promise if we confess it, God will forgive it. Oh, we've got the precious promise where the Lord said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We've got the promise that Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Those are exceeding great and precious. We've got the promise we're going to live forever. We've got the promise we're going to walk on gold streets and never die. God, never have no problems. All oh, that comes from the Word of God. Like the old lady said one time, a man come home, her nephew or somebody come home from seminary, and he said, now, Grandma, you can't take that Bible so literally like that. It's, it's not been translated correctly. And she said, well, I've translated a few of them promises myself, and I found out they work just fine, if you believe them. Amen? Yeah. Number seven, lastly, it's pure in its prophecies. It's pure in its prophecies. Isn't it going to be something when it all turns out to be true? Wars, rumors of wars, the, rap, the rapture of the church really hit, the Antichrist coming, the tribulation, the advent, the millennium, eternity, the white throne judgment, all the movie stars and football players and wrestlers and rock singers and every knee bowing, every tongue confessing, people being dropped into the lake of fire, Whew. where the worm hath not and the fire is not quenched. Isn't it going to be something when God has the devil there and his angels and he casts the devil off into the lake of fire? We're all standing there in our glorified bodies somewhere beside the throne and we're saying, Amen, even so, Lord God Almighty. Thou hast judged the great whore, and thou hast done what's right in your sight. And but boy, isn't that going to be something? Isn't that going to be something? The book said it's all going to happen. Without going into a big long thing tonight and closing, I'll say this. For the saved, if you're saved here tonight, do like my pastor used to tell us. Learn it, love it, and live it. Holy Bible book, divine, precious treasure, thou art mine. Mind to tell me whence I came. Mind to teach me what I am. Mind to chime, chide me when I rove. Mind to show a Savior's love. Mind thou art to give and guard. Mind to punish or reward. Mind to comfort in distress, suffering in this wilderness. Mind to show by living faith man can triumph over death. Mind to tell of joys to come and the rebel sinner's doom. Holy Bible book divine, precious treasure, thou art mine. 
The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation. Its doctrines are holy. Its precepts are binding. Its history is true. Its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise. Believe it to be saved. Practice it to be holy. Let it be light to guide you, food to support you, comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map. It's the pilgrim's staff. It's the pilot's compass. It's the soldier's sword. It's the Christian's chart. It tells of paradise restored, heaven open, and hell disclosed. Christ is its subject. Our need is its design. God's glory is its end. Let it fill your mind. Rule the heart. Guide the feet. Read it prayerfully and frequently and slowly. It is to be read in this life, opened at the judgment and remembered forever. Who should read the Bible? All for guidance. The strong for direction. The hardy for warning. The humble for exultation. The trouble for peace. The weary for rest. The doubting for assurance. The sinner for salvation. The the young to learn how to live, the old to learn how to die, the ignorant for wisdom, the learned for humility, the rich for compassion, the poor for comfort, the dreamer for enchantment, the practical for counsel, the weak for strength. The unsaved should believe it and be saved today. Tomorrow be too late. The Bible's pure in its production. It's pure in its preservation. It's pure in its presentation. It's pure in its provision. It's pure its protection, its pure in its promises, and thank God it's pure in its prophecies. It all turned out like God's book said that it would. Amen and amen. Let's stand and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Amen. Let's sing tonight, Brother John. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I wonder tonight, does the Word of God have proper place in your life? If it don't, if it don't, get it there tonight. Put it ahead of those magazines. Put it ahead of that TV show and get in the Word of God and put it first in your life. Father, I pray that you'd bless now the Scripture, the preaching. I pray it find a lodging place in people's hearts. Do what ought to be done with it in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. What are we going to sing, brother? 425. Amen. Number 425, verse 7. Oh, my comrades, say the thing no way. last one and let's wave them by back to heaven on the course. Go ahead. Fierce and long the battle rages but our help is near. Sing it. Honor comes our great commander. Cheer my call and cheer. Hold the fort for I am coming. Jesus signal still. Stop right there tonight. We need to have a quick meeting with the bookstore workers over in my office right quick, real quick. And listen, everybody that's going on the trip to Hammond, Indiana, pastor school at Hammond, Indiana, or if you'd like to go, you're going to meet over here in the uh, ladies' choir room. Y'all pray for Sister Linda Howe. They took her to the hospital a while ago and got some pain in her stomach and don't know exactly what's wrong with her yet, but uh, pray for her. She's out here in Marion Hospital. 
And then don't forget me in that special service on Thursday night at the courthouse, okay? God bless you. Have a little fellowship. Amen. Have a little fellowship. <laughs>